Hey, this is Rob Zombie, and you're watching Fuse On Demand. Get it when you want it. What's up, you guys? This is Mike Shinoda from Lincoln Park, and you're watching Fuse. My name's Chester, and um, I'm in Lincoln Park, and I, I like to rock. I'm Joe. I'm in Lincoln Park, and I like to roll. I'm Mike, and I'm in Lincoln Park. What are you doing, Mike? And I rap. Hey, I'm Brad, and I'm in Lincoln Park, and I'm the bookish one. I am Phoenix, and in a recent poll, I was voted the 13th best bass player in the world. <laughs> My name is Rob, and I'm in Lincoln Park, too, and I play the drums. Rob, your sarcasm is really ruining the interview. The first time I've actually met the guys. See, uh, when we do videos and stuff, I have I have the entire band shoot their parts <laughs> first, and I show up a couple days later and do my own parts live. We've worked it out. It's kind of cool. No, they put me I, in a plastic box. I can't see any of them. On a serious note, we all actually met each other in chat rooms on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, dates we, we we like the MP3s that <laughs> we're downloading to, for each other, and that's how we um, musically collected our uh, our our egos together. I don't think we really know why it sold that many copies. We just, we made a good record, we thought. When we were finished it, we were really proud of the record. And there were a lot of different elements that went into it. We really spent a lot of time on the internet promoting it before we had a record label. We built street teams, and we were always very conscious, conscious of all that stuff. So when the record came out, we were just hoping that it would sell like, I think Chester had the highest bid of it, it selling, what, what was your bid, like 8,000 8, records, and all of us didn't have any idea how many it was going to sell. We knew that there was some kind of hype that came out and sold like 46,000 copies the first week, and we just were dumbfounded. We didn't, we didn't understand it. That was probably we hope the, we can do that again. That was probably the first yeah, point yeah. we were just, we just threw up our hands and said, okay, we all bets are off. I won't be We were actually sitting in the bus and our driver had put out this travel magazine that had a feature on this place called Miora and we were looking at the pictures and we were just like, man, what is this place? It looked like almost otherworldly and it's actually a series of rock formations on which were built monasteries and the pictures just had this epic quality to them in the sense of timelessness. I don't know why I Breaking the habit, I think, is probably the, 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 the one that I think people all across the board, um, I think, can relate to a lot and it can really get into the melody of it and the music's really different and for some reason it catches our ear. The funny thing about Breaking the Habit is I had been trying to write lyrics about that topic for about five years and every time I wrote it, I'd, it would just kind of go the wrong way. For some reason, when I heard the music to um, Breaking the Habit, the lyrics just came together in like two hours. It was so easy. Mike was pretty amazed and he came in, he was really excited about it and I remember his face and everything. He was like, check this out. And he kind of hummed the melody to me and then I read the lyrics and I heard the music and I went, this is going to be brilliant. I played it for Chester, he loved it. He, he took it home, like practiced it and added his like touch to it. And the other guys listened to it and told us that we had screwed ourselves because we had raised the bar. We were pretty amazed because in my opinion it's, the, it's one of the best songs that we've written um, as a group and it was also the first song that we had recorded on the record. So it set the bar really high into making sure that everything else um, was equally good but in a different way. And so that really kind of pushed us even further than we were already pushing ourselves at that point.
And let's talk about this new record, Minutes to Midnight. Really, really groovy title. Where does it come from? Um, well, it actually comes from a, a special I was watching on the History Channel, of all places. Um, it, it, it happened to be uh, about it, the Doomsday Clock. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, they kept saying, like, five minutes to midnight in whatever year, you know, and uh, it moves back and forth. And I just thought the idea of <clears throat> midnight being, like, the ultimate, like, the end of all time, mm -hmm. or it could be, like, the end of, like, with the band, like, the end of one era, the beginning of something new. It, it just felt like it really fit. And uh, you can apply it to, like, all sorts of different scenarios outside of just the band. And so, um, you know, we were having a really hard time naming the record. We were actually, like, this close to just calling it Linkin Park because we had basically nothing to work with. <laughs> there was a few that we kicked around, but, like, it was just... If, if two guys liked it, everybody else hated it. Right. You know, or there was, there was like, literally nothing that we could all agree on. So, um, which, is, which is really weird for us. Yeah. <laughs> is, is it true you wrote of over a hundred songs and it was like what, over a year? Yeah, our writing process is a little bit different, I think, than, than what is normal. And, and we do function a little bit more like a, kind of like a studio project, mm -hmm. almost like in a, in a sense, like Rick compared it to like a, like a hip hop production. We don't ever sit in a room and kind of jam to write songs. Early on, we're all kind of passing around hard drives we're writing individually and in pairs and just getting ideas out. So with that, I mean, seven hard drives in the band, one being the community hard drive. On those seven hard drives for this album, there's, I mean, upwards of 150 songs. So we, we figured out ways to write other than that. And for us, it's natural, but you bring in somebody else into that process who isn't familiar with, with what we do, like Rick for this album, and he's right. kind of looking at it going like, this is exciting for him because he's never worked in this way, but at the same time, he's like, it's really crazy how you yeah. guys write. And he's like, he's like, we've got engineers here, so like, we don't really need you guys in here messing with the equipment. And you know, it, it's kind of funny, but um, I, you know, we gave Mike a production credit on the on the album this time right. around, and I say we gave it to him because he's always he's always basically acted as like the in-house producer of the band, and uh, and so it's al he's always been like the guy we go to his house sit in front of his computer you know mic up his room um or the or the rehearsal space or whatever and sit down and twiddle some knobs and push buttons and stuff like that All right, we are now here with Linkin Park, the men behind the tour, Project Revolution. As uh, Project Revolution uh, gets ready to wind down here in the States, have you ever, maybe you have, but have you decided to take it like internationally and do Project Revolution like maybe Australia or Europe? That would yeah. probably be the next step, you know, but we haven't really talked about it yet. It's it's a, it'd be an interesting thing, you know. I mean, this is a really, uh, this is a really great tour for us. Mm -hmm. uh, we really enjoy playing with the other bands and, I think that every time we've come out, every time we go out on tour, we try and step up what we do. Um, and I'm personally really happy with the sets we're playing right now. The, the production, everything looks great. And um, especially for fans that like to show up to multiple shows, yes. you know, we switch the setup every night. We do different things. There's a little room for improvisation, whatnot. With all that said, it's like we're always trying to do something new and different with our tour. We just started selling the, the live show. Like you can come to the show and oh, buy fantastic. the show you came to. So hopefully, you know, we'll keep keep evolving it and changing it. been in the studio for quite a bit on this record. Uh, it's taken a few twists and turns. Rick Rubin and I are producing um, as usual. It's just, you know, the six of us in a room really kind of hammering everything out. I think that our creative um, muscles are, are 
really strong right now. Like we've been in the studio a lot and, and with no fatigue, with no letting up. So the ideas are just flowing really freely and it's a really creative space. At this point, we're just starting to really focus down on the tracks that'll make the, the album. It's always tough when people ask, you know, what an album is going to sound like. I just don't, I feel like you're going to have to just hear it to see, to, to, to understand what it is. Mm -hmm.